and welcome back to another episode of Master Your Life with Kate McKay, a podcast dedicated to amazing stories of grit, determination, and transformation. I love stories, and the wonderful way to get more stories is to interview amazing people like my guest today, Ron. Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I adore your passion for making a difference in the world, so it's great to be in this conversation. Thank you. And you also were was re, you were referred to me by someone amazing. So it's always great when I say, "Hey, is there anybody that you think I mm-hmm. should talk to?" and they refer people. I think that's the best way, isn't it? It is. I love how we're all coming together more and more as leaders and influencers in the world. Yep. It's powerful. I remember my um, my coach, Brendan Bouchard, said um, one of his tasks that he put on us in, in a group was when you leave a situation, even if it's the waitress or anything, is there anyone you think I should know? Or if there's any place that you think I should see, um, it's just being more curious. And we do lose that, don't we, Ron? We do. I think people are so much more ruled by fear than trusting that if we just show up, other people want to show up as well. We're all desiring the same thing and we become so protected that we miss the opportunity of one another. And you and I came into this world as dynamite (laughs) to break through (laughs) that. So I'm just going to read your bio um, just briefly because you have so much I want to talk to you about. Uh, And here we go. Ron Baker is the founder of the School of Self Mastery in New York City, New York City. Bioenergetics. Energetics. (laughs) Bioenergetics, therapist, healer, speaker, and author. Ron has had the opportunity to guide thousands of clients from around the world through a unique process of personal transformation over the last 25 years. Ron has led 16 worldwide events with sacred sites like the Grand Pyramid of Egypt and Machu Picchu. I'm carb depleted. I already told Ron this. I'm getting ready for competition. So I said, just excuse me while I fumble. Um, Inspires millions of people from around the world to join together. Ron has just released an Amazon bestseller called Bright Lights, Big Empty, which I've had on my, there it is. It's such a gorgeous cover. I've had that on a post-it note on my desk forever. So today I'm going to order it. Um, It is, again, called Bright Lights, Big Empty, A Journey of Profound Awakening. And today we're going to talk about the power of transformation. I swear you are my my twin in male form as far as our language and what we're really fully committed to. So I, I would love to just start out with a question since we are so much dynamite people in the world of blowing up old preconceived thoughts and belief systems and helping people do that because we've done it. And I believe that both of us are here to model um, that courage and that ability that it's possible to go through really incredible challenges and struggles and transform and transmute through them and then model that for other people. So my question to you is, could you bring us to a place where you really felt and I could say it two ways, whether it is what was your greatest, your your greatest and most wonderful failure, or when is that time where you really had a dark night that that saw you see to your inner self that you needed to make a bolder action to move into the dark, to transform into the light? I would say no one's ever asked me that question, and I adore it. My greatest failure was not showing up for my inner self and putting so much focus on the outer, which is what we do when no one teaches us how to champion and trust our value. And so I started out as a child. My dad never said one single thing to me growing up, not one conversation. And so I was in constant self-doubt and confusion and hurt. And I personalized all that, which is what we do as children. And therefore, I was convinced I didn't have any worth and value. Mm. And then I discovered I had some talents. And so I ended up getting some attention and that fed on itself. And it literally led me to 
a world-class career where I performed over 60 leading roles in Broadway shows and opera all over the world. That's incredible. My biggest wake-up call for this failure was when I made my debut at Lincoln Center in New York City. And if, for those of you who don't know, it's probably the most famous performing arts center in the world. And I made my debut and it went really well. And I still felt like the little kid from North Carolina whose dad never spoke to him, that I was making some major failure. I just didn't know what it was. And as I sought help from so many different teachers from different cultures, different religions, different approaches, different healing modalities, they all pointed me back to my inner self. And when well, I began- it interesting, right? Because as an actor, because this was the same thing for me, it was the only thing I ever got A's in. So it's so interesting that you and I would have this aha that we were so deeply unworthy. And here we were in front of a, you and Lincoln Center, dude, me almost naked on a stage in a bikini, kind of, you know, but the thing is, (laughs) it's that crazy thing that people look at us and go, how courageous. And you still had that, that deep feeling of empathy, even though we are in the work of real. What, yeah. Can you talk about that? It is courageous to get up in front of people and share or do a role or whatever. But if you're doing a role, you're not being yourself. And it doesn't mean you've invested on the inside. It means you've invested in your talents. You know all about competing. And oh, so you invest in your talents and you invest in your body and you invest in your voice, mm-hmm. but not your heart and your soul and your essence. And this How was the problem. To win a- accolades. See, this is the part with me that I'm confused at. Yeah. How is it that you were still able to have that level of success in that role? I can see how people can fake it in business, but with theater, you kind of, I don't know, you could fake it. <laughs> no, you're not faking it, but yeah. you're, but you're being the person mm. that you're supposed to be. Yeah. This is what I was doing. I was trying to be perfect and trying to be impressive and trying to be the mask of who I decided to be. And then I got on stage and I had permission to express who I was supposed to be in a role. I was a master at playing roles. This is what I had done my whole life. Gorgeous. And I just had never played authentic Ron. And I had no idea who that was. And it was so devastating to discover that I could get standing ovations and sign autographs and dine with royalty and be on stage with Supreme Court justices and have no idea who I was on the inside. And thank goodness we had a wake-up call because the contrast of all that outer glamour and the inner, which says, you're supposed to be really fulfilled and happy. And you feel the antithesis of that. It literally starts to create a tension. And I said, you know what? I have an opportunity to travel the world. I'm going to seek out every leader, every teacher, every wise person, every kahuna, every shaman, every... And I literally had all of them point back to, let me give you some clues and hints for connecting back to your inner self. And man, I would not trade my inner self that I now have, my inner sense of self-value and realizing as adults, we get to choose who we're going to be. Prior to that, I was playing a role that my child had decided I had to be, and it was a matter of life and death. And if I don't impress and I don't do, then I'm going to be lost and ignored and rejected like my father was doing for the rest of my life. And so it's such a big conundrum to be in. But as I began to build that inner sense of self, it is now priceless to me. And it has been priceless to say to thousands of other people You are a sacred individual on a soul journey, and you have specific challenges that are there to serve you. So as an example, I had the challenge of zero nurturing from my father. Well, what did that do? It put all my focus on it. If I had gotten a mediocre level of nurturing, I might have just accepted it and moved on and led a very, uh, a less rich life. And so I was on a committed journey to find out what is missing. What did I need? 
And as I put together the pieces, I've now quantified it into nine specific nurturing needs that every single person needs for the rest of their lives. We don't need others to provide it as the source, except when we're kids. But then we need to have that modeled and taught to us about self and how to become the source of claiming our own value. And as adults, we get to decide, who am I going to be? What choices can I make that are going to make me really proud to be me? Mm. And so that is a version of the journey. Yeah, it's powerful. And I have a whole chapter, actually. And this is a conversation I have often, particularly with my male clients in Claim Your Inner Warrior, which is my book specifically for men. I have a whole chapter on getting your needs met. And, and the subtitle is, well, what are needs? And I think that the bottom line is you'll have men that are listening going, I have no idea what you're talking about, Ron. What are you talking about? Yep. I don't even know. Needs, you're embarrassing me because I can't even. Well, what yeah. would you say to the people out there that don't even know what you mean? Because this is the truth, Ron. There are people that have no idea what they need. I guarantee you. Almost everyone lacks an awareness of what we actually need. Mm -hmm. People think we need food, clothing, and shelter. Those are just survival needs. And those are things that we can't take for granted because there are plenty of people in the world who don't have those things. But that is like the baseline foundation and is has very little to do with self and the blossoming of self into more and more and more of our potential. And so... I have never taught one single person who could name nine nurturing needs, not one. And so when I start to name them mm -hmm. and I say, okay, you've only had one session with me in this one hour, have you felt safe? Yes. Have you felt connected? Mm -hmm. Yes. Have you felt an affectionate environment? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you felt acknowledged as an individual? Yes. Have you felt accepted right where you are in your journey, no matter where that is? Yes. Have you felt compassion from me? Yes. Have you felt clarity? In this case, clear guidance and information? Yes. Have you felt encouraged to show up and respond and claim yourself? Yes. Have you felt support? To have the learning curve of your journey. You're telling me in one hour, you've now experienced nine nurturing experiences that you can learn to trust consistently because you cannot trust something you haven't experienced. I'm going to say that again. You cannot trust something just because it's a clear concept only what you experience. And so we learn to experience, my dad doesn't see me. He doesn't acknowledge me. I am unworthy. Well, that was the decision I made out of the experience that was very real. But when I learned to identify these needs and to provide them for myself, it made all the difference in the world because when we receive nurturing, either as a child or when we're a hundred, that starts to open us and soften us and penetrate through the defenses that we've created and lived behind. It penetrates through the role we've been playing, whether it's the caretaker or the super achiever or the black sheep or the whatever role. It penetrates through all of that and touches us at our core. And when we learn to trust nurturing, no matter what age, no matter what level we are today, it begins to awaken and blossom layer after layer after layer of self, authentic self that's been in there, but so busy going, no, I don't have time for that. I have to achieve my butt off in every moment. I have to prove myself. But once I started doing that other thing, the I'll do it visually. The wound, which was so big, became smaller as my empowered adult grew and trusted. I deserve just as much as anyone else. And I make choices that affirm my worthiness because I'm proud of my choices and it feeds on itself. And we literally blossom into more and more of our potential. So good. That's such a beautiful description. That has to be just like a whole excerpt. And I'm going to have to get you the, um, the uh, transcript because it's so good. I mean, that was brilliantly said. 
Thank you. I love that. And we'll, we definitely should list the nine needs. And I have like a whole list of them. I think that I have like 50 and it's just like this um, random list because mm -hmm. sometimes we just don't even know what that is. So what happens though, with our somatic experience because to, to feel something somatically through the body is the way it has to originate. We feel first. And then, but then it seems like we've hijacked the feeling body into the thinking body. Yep. So it sounds like once we name it and then we move into it, well, how do you view that process of becoming more aware of the feeling of a need? If we look back at childhood, we literally, every single person, it doesn't matter what race, religion, culture, or gender, every single person develops through the same seven stages of development. Mm -hmm. And the first stage is physical. And we literally are a little infant. And for the first 18 months of life, we either learn from the first three nurturing needs that we feel safe, connected, and affection. And that allows us to open and land and ground in our physical bodies. Mm -hmm. But we're still very much all about whatever mommy feels, I feel. And Mommy determines whether I'm safe or not. Now, dad, certainly, or whoever your primary caregivers were, I just use the archetypes of male and female energy, but whoever your primary caregivers were, that is what we tune into. And we either learn to receive and we open, we'll just ask any adult, do you feel safer giving or receiving? They're going to say giving mm -hmm. because we did not learn to feel safe to receive. We did not open. And so we learned to protect and defend. Scientists have even discovered in epigeneticists that if a single cell does not feel safe in its environment, it thickens its walls. Can you imagine trillions of cells not feeling safe? Mm. And that becomes our energetic armoring. So the very first stage of awakening our individuality as a child is the awakening of our feelings. When we're about one years old, we begin to become mobile. And when we go out and begin to stimulate our five physical senses, touching and tasting and feeling physically, we stimulate feeling hormones, and it awakens the second energy center of the body. And so the first layers of the individuality are our feelings. And we needed, just like we needed guidance that said, this is your nose, this is your ear, and this is your chin. We needed people to say, I see that you're feeling sad. That's what that is. Yes. And you're safe to feel sad. And I'm here to Add three more nurturing needs, acknowledge and accept with compassion every feeling that you have while I still hold a safe space of connection, safety, and affection. Then we learn to land and claim my feeling is lovable and safe. Uh, we have lived on a primitive emotional planet. I, I have never taught one single person who got the emotional encouragement, nurturing that we needed. And so people learn instead to personalize my feeling is unlovable. My feeling is wrong and bad. And so we close that off. And then by the time the third stage of development happens, the awakening mental body in the cerebral cortex of the brain, once that mental awakens, it is no longer free to discover. What it does is it describes the limitations of the shamed feelings. Mm -hmm. That's not safe. These are the limits. I can't. I don't deserve. No one's investing in me. No one's championing me and teaching me how to con It's not logical, but it's a description of what's actually the experience. And so we learn to trust that experience. And so we go, okay, well, I better decide who I have to be. And I better put on a mask and I better establish a role in order to have a place to fit in. And that is the setup of childhood. And we become so hijacked emotionally by an over-dependence on the mental male energy inside each one of us, whether we're a man or a woman. And so the control of a patriarchal society is not about gender. It's about the hyping of the mental and the squashing of the emotional.
So that's a very involved answer, but it's just so helpful to it understand is. why we end up trapped well, it's like, like that. You think about the evolution. It's like, if you think about the onion, even it's like, there's all different layers of our growth and awakening. And even Maslow's hierarchy of needs is, and I talk about that in my book, it's outdated because there is like, yes, we're woke at the top, but then what's after that? That's not the end, people, <laughs> you know? And most people from that old model that talk about woke is yes. mostly mentally exactly. clearer, but yes. not emotionally safe no. and connected to the experience and intimacy with ourselves and one another. Mm. And that is what's next. Exactly. That is what makes all the difference. So um, I had I talk about this often, this thesis of sort of like where we're at. And I love your take on how you feel you can be uh, the champion through this time, um, because I, I, I do believe that this is your time at a whole nother level. This is like center stage and another level for you, Ron. But, you know, we had covid, obviously. And so we became a, 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 a world of fear. And then we moved into second stage, which was the, the time of protection, us against them, divisiveness. And I believe that we've moved into another time. And I believe the most productive people, the people that did the work doing during that inward time are here as the change agents. The people are going to really be the ones, the helpers that, as Mr. Rogers talks about. But my, my sadness and my drive and motivation to do what I do every day is really based on the fact that. I'm going to be generous and say it's 80% of people are still in fear and still in protection and maybe 20%. I'm being generous, Ron. You are. You are. Um, you know, I know it's like five to 10, but I'm a really, I'm a big positive person. Well, you know, when you hear statistics, only 90% 90, 90 of people do no personal development or spiritual development work every day. That means only 10% do. So well, let's use the 10%. So what is what is the the role that you feel that you can play right now as we move into a time that's going to be messed up, Ron? Yeah, Some messed yeah. up things are happening. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd like to jump into what you just shared and then get to the answer to Please. the question you just asked. I think that the way to be encouraging instead of the 80-20 thing is to go 100% of people are doing the best they know how. Yes. They're doing the best they know how, but if I don't have an education, how do I navigate this? Mm. So if I say to you right now, I need to build a jet engine. It's your job to teach me. Go. I'm waiting. Go, go, <laughs> go. You can't pass on something you don't know. 100%. And so I think 99% of people are very ruled by fear, but we've learned this is the norm. Mm -hmm. If you learn to walk like this, eventually it feels normal. And so I said to a teacher in my grad school, I don't think I actually have any insecurities. Huh? I meant it. I was so numbed out to my fear mm. because I had to achieve and be strong and be what I considered powerful. It is not powerful to squash and bury our insecurities, our fear and our shame. But if I didn't know what to do with it, it was the best choice I thought to make. So I was one of the 100% of people doing the best I knew how. But that statement, I don't think I have any insecurities, scares me today. So to how do you remember that? Because <laughs> it's the way the <laughs> teacher looked at you or it's kind of funny that that's you remember this point where it's like, it's almost like embarrassing shame. I don't even know, but it's like, how could I have said that? Like, where was I? I'm just curious. Why do you remember that so clearly? I can't explain this very well, but I think it was because my soul, which we haven't even addressed at all yet, because I, I, let me jump into soul for two seconds. When we're born, we have a child, an adult, and a soul inside us from the beginning. But when you're six, you don't know there's an adult in there waiting to come out. If I said to you as a six-year-old, there's an adult inside you, it would freak you out. You would have no reference point. And yet here we are as adults in the same body. And it was in there. And we've awakened however much of that potential we have. Well, I now say to you all, there's a soul inside you. And it's a heck of a lot more than some woo-woo, spiritual, disconnected, whatever idea. Because we just have no idea what it actually means and how it works. So I teach my clients 
The soul sets up the curriculum for a lifetime in your childhood. And if you don't get the education and nurturing tools, you end up on the hamster wheel of your child agenda, like my proving self, for the rest of your life. But as adults, we're going to attract very similar archetypes to the setup so that we have an opportunity. So for instance, me attracting people who didn't know how to see me or value me, me attracting unavailable emotional people in my life was a reflection of my father continued. And so I had authority figures who didn't know how to provide what I needed Mm. because that's what I actually did need Mm. the reflection of my childhood setup so I could eventually go, the emperor's wearing no clothes. (laughs) I need to seek differently. (laughs) I need to find the wiser people who can help me. (laughs) True that. And so- Where's my guru? (laughs) Exactly. So (laughs) I found lots of teachers to add pieces and parts to it to help me awaken. And weren't they patient, Ron? Can you believe how patient some of our teachers are? (laughs) We, as people who want to help other people, know that we required tons of patience. My wounded stuff required a ton of patience (laughs) from a lot of people. And so it's my great privilege to bring that compassion and patience to my clients now. Because my initial starting out place when I was in the mask and the wound was, okay, I heard the answer. Now I'm supposed to have integrated it by yesterday and there's no excuse, no process at all. And so I am thrilled to have had 25 years of practicing with clients where I go, it is my great privilege to hold a space while you blossom and continue to blossom and build trust in this new, remarkable, fulfilling approach to life. Mm. So yeah, patience. (laughs) Yes. Totally. So going back to like, so we we're talking about the soul, which I love because I, I do believe that we come in, we get dropped in as souls. And, and I think our kids choose us, honestly. I feel like my kids certainly did, right? They're on a path. And yep. so it's like, that's what I tell my kids. And it's like, you got to own it, babe. You chose it. Uh... <laughs> I pass the buck and they always would roll their eyes like, oh my God, no, I didn't. Like, yeah, you actually did. Uh... <laughs> You chose me. <laughs> you. Congrats. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just crazy. I'm not, I, I tell my kids, I'm like, you know, God bless you. I wasn't a, I wasn't a long <laughs> to get born into. So, I, but then that was the blessing to my son who passed away. I know that he chose mm. me because he knew I could transform it into nice. something gorgeous and beautiful. Mm. Um, so th- when we think about now, and I, I love this thesis too, that we've done this self-work run, right? We foster that in our individual clients, groups, people we speak to, this podcast. We're fostering the growth of the self, our self-work. And I believe also too, it's this time, it is becoming not just a nice thing, but a freaking obligation and responsibility that we focus on our social work. We are here to learn from relationship. We are here to heal and grow through relationship. This COVID, this pandemic thing, putting us in isolation and then us against them has destroyed a lot of people's and even made that box even smaller around people's fear. It's become, it's choking people with the high rate of anxiety, depression, suicide, particularly in men right? This is what's happening. So what is your, how do we speak into that, Ron? How do you speak into that? Have you gotten your copy of Claim Your Inner Warrior? It is my newest book available now on Amazon. The book is directly geared towards men and the women who love them. Grab your copy today. Eventually, we all (laughs) need a wake-up call. We all need a wake-up call. I gotta take a break. You are, I have to tell you how much I love interviewing people of acting experience. Because I ask <laughs> a question and you're like, eventually, like perfect beat. Ah, it was perfect. Thank you. I'm just acknowledging your brilliance. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever the soul decides to try and get our attention with a big enough symbol, mm. like I'm sure I had tons of opportunities to see that I wasn't connected to my inner self. 
but it took reaching Lincoln Center in New York City, doing a show with Stephen Sondheim. I don't know if you all know who he is, but he was perhaps the most famous composer lyricist of the last 50 years on Broadway. So here I am doing this show with Stephen Sondheim. That was about as big as my two by four was going to get to say, <laughs> you don't know how to fulfill yourself. So every person is having a wake up call. And in my opinion, if we have to look for gifts, which I like to do with everything, mm. what are the gifts here? What can I practice here? What can I learn here? What is life showing me here rather than just resisting something I don't like? The pandemic, it literally sent everybody to their room. Mm. You go to your room and you be with you. Ugh, and bad everybody girl. Bad hated, boy. hated being told I can't continue to mm. do my escape my distraction my addictions i have to go and be with me mm. and this was a powerful revealer that we're a world in need of this education about self and nurturing self so yes i love the way you said with passion we are here to learn through relationship relating to each other i've got to have a relationship with myself mm. or who's going to be in relationship with you mm. But if how I do we do it now, though? Like, the thing is, is that from our generation and like the 70s, like I'm going to be 60. So it's just this generation of like the 70s in particular, which was like, I'm OK, you're OK. It was individualization. And the problem is the newer level of consciousness in younger people is not that. It isn't that. And this is the thing is I believe that younger people have a deeper and a much profound and much more realistic understanding of consciousness and life. I just do. I coach them. I have kids. I'm aware of that. I appreciate the younger souls. I just do because yeah. they're open to growth and have a deeper understanding of the higher mind. They were brought into the world knowing with a greater level of, they don't need to do acid. They don't need to go to dead shows. They don't need to do all these things in order to know the dark and the light. I, I just, that's my belief. But what, how do we at this point today wake people up with those nine needs of acknowledging, of listening, of coming with compassion, of coming with loving and understanding, but at the same time, putting the fire under people's butts that they need to wake up because the time is now, Rod. We, there are going to be a lot of suffering and I'm not trying to be dramatic. I really am not because no, I, I get really it. truly believe that we are coming into a <clears> financial <throat> and economic crisis in a way that no one has known. I think even the baby boomers are going to be rocked. I truly believe it. Why yeah. do you think I lift weights? I am staying strong physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, because I know I'm going to be the warrior that people are lined up against. And I'm not being dramatic. I've known this from the beginning because my yeah. son's death prepared me for it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I just would love your, your thoughts. Yeah, there are so many pieces in what you just shared to respond <laughs> to. However, let's start with, if we look at the world from the last 30 years, we have accelerated and awakened and developed in knowledge, potentials, technology, more in 30 years than in the last 3,000 years. Mm. Why is that happening? I talk about this in the book. Mm. What's happening on the planet? The soul is accelerating mm. just like we got accelerated at puberty and all of a sudden energy moves in our bodies and everything changed about our bodies and mm. it awakened us into the potential of adult. Well, energy is moving again on the planet for these last 30 years, and it's awakening the part of ourselves that we've been in touch with, which has been the mental body. And it is literally inspiring us into discoveries that we didn't even have the internet 30 years ago. It has awakened so much mental potential, but we're never going to be fulfilled and value each other from the most profound mental acuity. We're not. So it's also accelerating the emotional energy to come up to finally be claimed. Why do you think so much of the planet is on antidepressants? They don't know what to do with their feelings. And this is the missing piece in such mm -hmm. a huge way. And why it is so crucial that people find teachers like mm -hmm. one of us. People mm -hmm. find teachers who know how 
to get them in touch with themselves, how to feel safe with feelings. Mm. Because I'm thrilled to say that in 25 years of teaching thousands of people, not one person has ever discovered a feeling that was unsafe Mm. from adult reality. Not one. Well, just like that whole concept behind shame. It's like shame (laughs) can't exist if it's named. You put light on something that you have shame around and it no longer has its power. Yeah, if we bring it into the light of day and we nurture it. So for instance, if I go back to an experience that was so shaming, which I talk Mm. about plenty in the book, Mm. my childhood and the shaming experiences I had, such as my dad was a semi-pro athlete, but not once did he ever invite me into the yard to play catch or throw or shoot or whatever with a ball. Not once, but he decided eventually it was time for me to go to the basketball tryouts in the city Mm -hmm. and he showed up and I'd never held a basketball in my hand. I was an utter disaster. I ended up on the city championship team, scared to death every single moment. And my dad never helped, never got me a ball, never taught me anything, just week after week of shame. And so I can now look back at that. And have huge compassion and nurture my child who was eight years old. Whereas if I stay stuck in the eight-year-old self and don't introduce these adult perspectives and truths, then I'm just going to feel if anybody really knew me, if they only really saw what I hold in here, they're going to realize I suck as a person. And of course, it's not true, but we hold that experience. Mm. So yes, just like the shame, we can learn to go back and reparent our own nervous system. But we have to learn as adults first what the nurturing experiences are, how to receive them from teachers like you and me, and then how to trust that and to be taught how to show up for self. So let's make this real for everybody. If you don't mind, let's do a quick exercise. Every person listening can discover the first three needs, safety, connection, affection. How connected are you even to yourself in this moment? This will be a great litmus test. So I'm going to say a word, and I don't want you to change a single thing about what you're already doing. Just pay attention. The word is breath. Don't change it. Just notice it. How are you breathing habitually? I've done this with so many people. I know what you're going to discover. Only one or two have ever not ended up discovering that they're breathing very shallowly down to about the middle or upper chest. This is what I call survival breathing. And this is because we hold the trauma of childhood down in the lower self, in the lower torso. And so we have escaped up to our heads, championed the mental body, decided who I have to be, and then I'm just going to give myself enough energy and air to survive because I don't want to shake that stuff up. I do not want to have to face that because I haven't learned how to face it. It's it's vacuum sealed. (laughs) sealed. Exactly. Or so we think. And so now we're going to do a proactive version of what we did as infants. As infants, we knew how to breathe into the full body. If I don't get into my body as an adult, I can't be connected. And if I'm not connected to myself, I can only offer my mental, my head into the equation of a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. So we can't really have relationship. We're reporting facts back and forth. And we wonder why our relationships don't work, why we're not having intimacy and fulfillment in relationships is because we're not in our experiential intimacy with self. Mm -hmm. So now we go to a proactive breath. An infant lying on its back in a crib, the only thing that moves is the belly. It goes up Mm -hmm. and down. You know from your children, this is true. The belly goes up and down. That's natural full body breathing. Well, we're going to do a proactive version of that. Just like you have muscles, But you go to the gym in order to build strength in those muscles. And so you literally build this capacity. Well, you don't walk down the street doing this with a dumbbell. You have a time of day where you build the scope of that strength, and then you have it at your disposal. If I'm breathing in this tiny little box, and then I go into any kind of challenge or contraction, I'm in trouble. I don't have 
strength in my breathing, mm-hmm. in my connection, in order to withstand the challenges that I have. So now I suggest that you take all of you listening, a proactive breath in the nose and a proactive out breath through the mouth. Do that now. And I'm going to take about 10 seconds of silence here. In the nose, out the mouth. I can guarantee you most people will pull the breath in to do a deep breath and their chest will expand in a big way. So now put one hand on your lower, lower abdomen and one hand on your chest (laughs) and see whether this is filling up in a big way. Many of my new clients find they have lost the coordination to even get down there. We want to look ripped and we want to look powerful and we might have lost the elasticity in order to even get in there and stretch that. That's crucial. Where do you think those feelings that are all needing nurturing exist? They exist down in that lower belly. So that's the in-breath. We need to fill up the lower body. Now the out-breath, I can almost guarantee you, is even scarier to most people. And so I say do a proactive out-breath through the mouth and most people go, and that is literally more than they were doing before. Yes, that is a forward step. Good for you if you're listening. (laughs) So now what I'm suggesting is that if you have a visual, great. If you're listening on the audio version, I'll describe it a little bit, but it's going to sound like this. Who ever breathes out like that? Well, if I want to build my bicep, I'm going to go and lift heavier and heavier into the scope of strength that I want. This is the strength of, guess what? The in-breath gives a clear message every time you breathe that says, this is how much I deserve to receive. Hmm, only enough to survive. Now apply that to the other arenas of your life, and you might begin to understand you're giving that message about everything. Mm. What is the out-breath? This is the safety I feel to share who I am on the inside. Well, if nobody ever said to me as a child, Ron, or they called me Ronnie at that time, Ronnie, what do you feel? What's going on with you? What is your perspective? I don't know. No one ever asked me. I'm not connected. And if I don't even know who I am, how I feel, what I need, how can I share it? And so we learn to close that capacity down. Mm. Most people are very, very tight, even in their jobs. I watch famous celebrities give interviews and they literally (laughs) give the interview and barely open the jaw at all. I could name some, but I don't want to call anybody out because it's not bad and wrong. Mm. It's just this is how protected we learned to be. Let me put on a smile and let me keep that jaw really tight. So what I say to my clients when I'm teaching them this, I go, okay, now take that proactive out breath and freeze. Don't move. And so they go, freeze. Okay. See if you can get one finger between your teeth. And they're like, no. (laughs) That's how protected and masked we have become. So I then say, okay, let's look at the adult reality. I'm going to do a breath and open mine to where I can get two fingers in between one on top of the other in between my teeth and pull the fingers out and see if I can keep it there. And I go, do I seem threatened to you in any way? No, you do it. Do you seem threatened? No, this is life affirming. You're having an experience of safety, an experience of stretching your comfort zone into this beautiful new capacity that's been sitting there all along. But if no one has ever suggested to you how to do a proactive, big scoped breath, you're not going to. You're going to do the child hamster wheel and survival breathe, and then wonder why you're having anxiety. Wonder why you don't know how to share what's going on with you. I say to people, do you have people with whom you share your deepest fears, share your challenges and conflicts? Mm, Not so much. How are we going to learn how safe we are? So that is why I wrote my story in this book. I didn't need everybody to know what my life was. It's not important, but what is important is the journey I reveal. 
because I take my own self through facing my challenges, applying the nine nurturing needs to heal the survival wounded child, to claim the empowered adult that builds more and more and more, and even talk about the awakening happening on the planet into soul consciousness for the first time in the history of the planet. That is what is trying to awaken. And so it's bringing us either into more potential for fulfillment, connection, and intimacy, or it's bringing us into bigger and bigger two by fours that are trying to get our attention about the choices we're making not working. This is why we have an acceleration of disease on the planet unlike anything we've known. It's why we're so afraid. Well, let me share that in my 25 years of doing this and moving energy, I've been sick two days in 25 years. One of those was food poisoning, which had nothing to do with being sick, really. So the bottom line is, we have so much potential. And if we learn to connect to self and nurture self, boom, more and more and more awakening can happen for every single person, no matter what your specific challenges are. I love how you tie in, because we all hear like the importance of breath, blah, 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 Wim Hof and yoga and all that. But I really appreciate your association with the breath in as and breath out as giving and receiving. I mean, we call breath as life, but the fact that it really is, we can tap in the breath to even our own sense of worthiness, that we are worthy of a full breath. When we show up as the adult seeking to champion that child inside who went through so much stuff, the stories I have heard, or just even the ones I share in my book from my own life, like the basketball story, Mm -hmm. shocking what we have survived, but we carry all that inside. People go, oh, no, I don't need to look. That's the past. What we don't understand is that the body stores the energy of anything we've squashed saying, nope, I can't deal with that. It's too much. Nope, that's going to be so threatening. And it doesn't go away. It's like whatever I put in this uh, bottle, (laughs) if I close the lid on it, this is going to be in here 25 years from now if I literally don't open it and learn how to release it. Mm -hmm. And so- The good news, another map. I love giving clear maps that point out the safety that's our first nurturing need. Think of when you were a child and you saw this house or this building or whatever, and it was huge. Oh my God, that is the biggest house I've ever seen as a little kid. And then you go back as an adult and you're like, that's not big. It's not big at all. It's just natural, normal, whatever. The same is true for feelings. If I'm a little child and the situation I'm in is twice as big as my little three, four-year-old self, no one's teaching me how to process and work through it. I turn away from that and the memory of it in my head is how huge it is. Mm -hmm. Then if I grow into adulthood still facing away, I don't want to do that inner work. That will be threatening. Those Mm. feelings that were so overwhelming, I don't want to ever have to deal with that again. When I teach people how to turn around as an adult and realize this is the reality, Mm -hmm. it's so manageable. It is unbelievable, just like the house wasn't that big. Mm. You can show up and learn how to nurture it. And that's why not one single person Mm. has discovered a feeling that was threatening to them. I like that. That's a massive power of perception tool. You know, it's the power of perception and being able to see things as they are. It's just a beautiful tie in with the breath. So um, we're just going to wrap up in a couple of minutes, but I would love uh, for you just to give some simple steps that you would suggest if someone's listening to this and they're like, that sounds all well and good, Ron Baker, and you're amazing. And, but you don't know my story or you don't even have any idea or I don't even think I have the courage to do that. Or I'm just waiting for a bigger two by cosmic two by four to put me upside the head. What would you say to those people, Ron? Every single person 
feels the same. I remember teaching a group early on in my career of doing this as a thought leader, nurturer, or whatever you want to call it. And I realized every single person in the group was sharing, trying to convince the group how they were the most unlovable one. And I stopped and I started laughing and I said, oh my God, listen to this. Everybody is trying to make a case for how unlovable they are. And you're all wrong. Mm. You're not the most unlovable one in the room. I am. And they all laughed. Yes, perfect. Because that's the myth of the child. Mm. And the powers that be that want to manipulate the population count on this Mm -hmm. and play on the unworthiness and the you can't do it. You have to put your power in my hands. And so what steps can people take? Realize that just as there are people who have gone to school to be able to provide profound scientific information, profound medical uh, advice, there are those of us who have dedicated our lives to providing nurturing education about self, self self-empowerment, self-love, self-value, all of it. And one of the main steps is we all need help. If you already knew how, you'd already be doing it. And so you're here listening to this program because you're curious about how, Mm -hmm. that you want to make a difference in your life. And so find someone, find someone who has a track record, who knows how to connect emotionally, who understands how to move energy, who can help you get in touch with your empowered, authentic self. That is the highest thing I could suggest. And there are books. If you feel you can't afford to do sessions with someone, go and get books by the people who have and get some simple starting tools and then show up for yourself. This is the biggest thing. As a child, I'm like, I don't have time to show up for myself. I got to go prove something. I've got to go take care of everyone else. Mm -hmm. I have to be the caretaker. You can't imagine. I tried to do a nurturing class for mothers, for young mothers. I went and stood out in front of a of a school that was for kindergarten through third grade. And I handed out flyers about nurturing time for moms. They're like, are you kidding me? I don't have time to do a class for nurture. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Exactly. You can't afford to not learn how to nurture yourself or that's exactly what you're going to teach your kids. Exactly. And we pass on the same limitations Mm -hmm. and we call it love, but it's self-sacrifice. It's like that, that we find that to be like sexy. Oh, my kids are first. That's a cultural disease. And I I didn't buy into it. I I was like definitely outcasted because I was like, wait a minute. What? Like, what? what?" And it wasn't like I was selfish, but it was like, what do you mean? And that's all they talk about is their kids. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, are you reading anything for yourself? Like, what do you? Do yeah. I, I was I said, a little verklumped. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. I said to a client one day, and I've said it to many since, who do you think is the most important person in this room? And they're like, well, I guess it's me because I'm paying for this session. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I am the most important person in this room to me. Yes. Please be the most important person in this room to you. Because otherwise, where are we going to model self-empowerment? Now, let me ask you one more question. Do I seem selfish to you? No, I'm not. I'm just aware of my needs and I'm taking care of my needs, physical, mental, emotional, sexual, and spiritual. Mm -hmm. And that inspires you toward doing the same thing, your own version of the same thing. So how many people do you think have benefited in the world because I made myself the top priority in my own life? Mm. Thousands and thousands. And if you talk about the sacred journeys, millions of people have benefited starts with self-love. We must learn how, and it's entirely possible. It does not take the entire day. Mm -hmm. You can do it. I say to people, you can nurture yourself in two or three minutes a day. One breath. In your life. One One breath breath compared to not. Right. One breath. I mean, just what. It's a starting place. Yeah. Well, that's that you drop some serious gold there. 
Yep. Again, it's just that whole breathing in, breathing out. I receive, I give, I give, I receive. Ah, so delicious. And then I can be in a relationship with Mm. you and I can create a healthy relationship with you. And your needs are just as important as my needs. Oh my God. Who knew? Who knew? (laughs) Oh, Ron, we could go on forever. This forever. is absolutely incredible. It's like you're speaking my language and I can I see why we got hooked up. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so great. I see us on a stage at Me some too. point in time. For Big sure, time. For sure. I, I swear to God, I have goosebumps. It's Yay. like legit. And you don't have to wear a, a sparkly bikini. <laughs> <laughs> I have done some shows where I was wearing a loincloth only. <laughs> no, no doubt. No doubt. Oh, my gosh. That's so awesome. So, you know, all audiences, please grab his book. It's uh, Bright Lights, Big Empty. Um, it's a bestseller. There it is. It's a beautiful cover. I love that. And that's available on Amazon. Grab it. I have, I'm have. i going to be able to throw away my post-it after this podcast. And I'm finally going to order it. And, you know, Ron, again, thank you. Thank you for being the light and a a person of extraordinary courage, a a nurturing warrior for the self and for self-love, self-honor, self-respect and teaching this beautiful concepts that are um, life-changing. I have goosebumps. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Back to you. And thank you all of you for tuning in to this amazing episode of Master Your Life. I'm Kate McKay. And until next time, breathe. Remember, your transformation, your self-love, your self-acceptance happens one breath at a time. Want to learn more about Kate? Check out our website at kate-mckay.com.